Hello listeners, as you might have heard in the last couple of episodes, we have been moving to a new podcast host, Podbean. What does this change for you? Well, absolutely nothing. As long as you're subscribed to us on iTunes or whatever podcast app you use on your phone, computer, tablet, whatever, the episodes will keep going to you as per normal. The only difference is if you're listening to us through, through Buzzsprout, you will have to go to Podbean. Uh, Buzzsprout should have been redirecting you. It possibly hasn't. <laughs> so all you need to do is go to ogtpod.podbean.com or you can download the Podbean app and search for us on there. Follow us, get in touch, might even get in touch back. That's the kind of pools we are. and welcome to episode 60 of One Good Thing, the podcast that never takes off its therapist's hat. I can heal you, films! <laughs> I'm Paul Goodman. And I'm the other one. And today we will be getting into the mind of Antichrist, Alberto Di Martino's 1974 horror drama about a paralysed young woman who becomes possessed by the devil after a hypnosis session goes terribly wrong. It was also directed by Lars von Trier and re-released in 2009 as the first in the controversial Danish director's Depression trilogy and recut into a completely new film starring Charlotte Gainsbourg and Willem Dafoe as a grieving couple retreating to a cabin in the woods after the death of their son. It also has nothing to do with the other film I just mentioned. <laughs> Disclaimer. Should say at the top of the episode, that was a lie. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of lies in this week's episode. Be, all, <laughs> be savvy, do your due diligence, and stay safe yeah. out there. It's a liberal conspiracy, everyone. <laughs> Antichrist was received like a pig with an erection. Some confusion, a bit of lust, and lots of anger. Some hunger? <laughs> <laughs> Some Whoa. a few pangs, yes. Uh, Lee Patch from the Herald Sun wrote, While Antichrist Kilter is most definitely switched to the off position, the film itself amounts to the most unwatchable cinema experience of 2009. This woman-hating, audience-baiting, nerve-grating tripe gets off to a rancid stand and then just rots away before your very eyes for 104 stupefying minutes. Lee Patch then answered her iron, put her shoes on her face, and put her feet through the TV before going back to watching the bin. <laughs> it's great to get off to a rancid start. <laughs> But can I can I get that to rot as well? <laughs> I can. And it's uh, the contestant from Great Britain there getting off to a rancid start. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's that's the worst thing to watch. Peter Bradshaw, writing for the Guardian, oh, said, "What genre does Antichrist belong in? Scary movie, extreme horror, psychological drama." None of the above. It's a practical joke, an exquisitely malicious hoax, a superbly engineered wind-up disguised as a film. Borat and Bruno have got nothing on Lars von Trier. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. And actually, if you get to the end of um, Antichrist, big if. But uh, <laughs> if you actually get there, yeah, there's a whoopee cushion. <laughs> Good old depressed Lars von Trier, always <laughs> with his jokes. <laughs> The public responded as if they'd seen a mouse with an erection, and you know how that goes. <laughs> Theus BJ on IMDb writes, Without a doubt, the most unpleasant and despairing movie I've ever watched. It's not just the graphic imagery that got to me, but the overall tone of the movie was incredibly dreadful, and you could almost feel a presence of some sort of evil, and gave it 10 out of 10 stars. <laughs> Real World, also on IMDb, wrote, After all the hype I heard surrounding Antichrist, I finally decided to sit down and watch it. Wow! This has to be the most disturbing film I've seen since Human Centipede, and gave it 1 out of 10 stars. <laughs> wow! It doesn't end there, though. Mr. M.N.R. Young's review, titled One Star, reads, Carp! Needless sex scenes, just plain old weird. And I'll tell you one thing, those fishing scenes left nothing to the imagination. <laughs> yeah, it didn't. Fishnet stockings? You do the math. Finally, Sharon on Amazon fucking hated the film, giving it 1, f one out of 5. She fumes. My dad wanted a copy. <laughs> My dad, look, I fucking hate my dad. He, his, <laughs> and his grossy layer he's got up there. I just buy him loathsome films, toss him in, and just hope that it <laughs> doesn't incite him to actually leave the layer tonight. The sounds of the gorging come from his maw, and for one more <laughs> night we are secure. <laughs> With a budget of $11 million, it grossed about 700000 back. It Great. scored 51% on Rotten Tomatoes, 49 on Metacritic, and 6.6 .6 on IMDb, which is very spooky. Ooh, what a conspiracy. Uh. It was booed and jeered at Cannes, and this fucking spanner over here bloody likes it. <laughs> Paul, how come you're such a twat? Well, the thing I like about it is, I don't know if you noticed this when you watched it, it's quite horny. We've seen some horny films here, Paul. We've though. seen some horny films. We've seen Sex, Lies, and we Potato Men. 
in our yeah, time. We saw lesbian vampire killers, Whoa! which was a horror. Yep. That was a horny horror. That and, was a horny uh, horror, and we're back in the realms of horny horror. Because yeah. um, it, you've got this you've got this bloke, this American guy, you know, this American stud played by Willem Dafoe. Paul, Paul, is he a lad? He's a bit of a lad. You know Willem Dafoe. Oh, and, I fucking um, love lads. Right, he gets together, right? He's, he's married, right, yeah. to this woman, and she's she's half French. What? She's a right, yeah, she's a right sort. Oh, I bet she's a right goer. <laughs> Well, she turns out to be because they, um, they, you see what they do is they, they, uh, they, um, yeah, yeah. they, 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 they have it off several times. No way. I know. Oh, bloody lad. It's fucking crazy. Paul, that sounds like pretty much the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so tell me about the plot. Let's get into the nitty gritty of this film, Antichrist. Well, speaking of getting into the nitty gritty, there we start with uh, Willem Dafoe getting on into his wife. What a lad. What a lad, indeed. They're having sex in the shower and yeah. having quite <laughs> a tumultuous time of it. We are left to assume it is, in fact, in slow motion and in black and white. Yes. With um, Handel's um, Lassia... Chio Bia- uh, Pianga, I think that's pronounced. Lassia Chio Pianga. Do I, mate? Hello, the lads. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, Handel? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> I literally have no idea. Were you in the Four Seasons? But yeah, they're they're having a, they're having a good old sex when suddenly their kid he gets up and starts wandering around the flat, probably mm. somewhat curious about the hardcore pounding that's uh, apparently going on. That's knocking things over and splashing yeah, it's water. Very destructive. About. Yeah, knocking toothbrush toothbrushes out of their containers. Oh, I hate that. Oh, you get all the carpet hairs. <laughs> All the but the bum hair falls on the carpet, and then the bum hair from the carpet goes on the toothbrush. You might as well be wa- wa- brushing your teeth with a big old bum at this stage, <laughs> like a lad would. <laughs> anyway, back to the back to the little lad who is also a lad. Who's also a lad? He's out looking for you know his own sort when he falls out the window. Oh, He yeah, he falls out the window to his death. Oh oh, yeah. Anyway, part one. <laughs> Pain. <laughs> begins. Yeah. <laughs> it begins. That was the intro, guys. Yeah, little kid's dead. Um, and they both take it relatively well. Well, MD4 cries a bit. Uh, and Charlotte Gaines throws a complete uh, mental and physical collapse. Yeah. So, you know, each to their own. Everyone deals with it differently. <laughs> that's just Charlotte Gainsbourg. That's just how she deals with most things. That is the way in which Charlotte Gainsbourg just goes about her daily schedule. Oh, this. She is French. It's a very exciting life. I did. I, I asked for pepperoni on this. Funk <laughs> plates, cheese in the air. <laughs> well, yeah. After after the whole pizza debacle, Pizza Gate, she ends up in hospital. Yeah, she's in hospital, yeah. and well, well, M. Defoe, he's not going to let you know trained medical professionals make informed decisions about his wife's health care. Who knows it better than mm. he does? We should point out he's a trained therapist. He's um, a trained therapist. She does. She does point this out um, yeah. as, as a lot, along with his promise to or his policy of never treating family he will on this occasion make an exception <laughs> because it's so super going to be such a super easy one because it's family yeah you know i oh, wouldn't it's family i wouldn't treat family but since it's family family yeah <laughs> <laughs> mates rates at this stage <laughs> he's very reasonable actually when he invoices her it's actually um <laughs> had a talk with wayne i think he gives you too much medication way too much stop it please trust others to be smarter than you He's straight out of medical school. He doesn't know what he's doing. No therapist can know as much about you as I do. He has her move back in with him rather than stay at hospital with her doctor. Makes um, She throws away her medication. Yep. And he begins to therapize her. Yep, he thoroughly therapists her. And yeah. goes badly. She's spending a lot of time crying, <laughs> angsty, not looking too good. And Yeah, he's, he's trying to talk, like clinically talk, talk her talk his way through her recovery this is what's going to happen it's all this reaction and this reaction it's all very chemical at the the yeah. base of it all i understand exactly how you're feeling and at one stage actually saying i am going to teach you how to breathe yes <laughs> teach you how to breathe can we have sex instead no that would be wrong he says can we though all right all right then but then after that particular 
bit of sex. Uh, William Dafoe feels very bad and feels uh, angry with himself as a professional. Yes. And doubles down on his therapizing. <laughs> He's going to go double down. And because he believes in immersion therapy, the best way, if you've got some sort of illogical, you know, irrational fear of something, best thing to do is just completely smother yourself in it. Yep. If you're afraid of jam, cover yourself in jam. Yeah. If you're afraid of death, you should kill yourself. You know, just really get involved in the thing that scares you. So they dig up the sun. No, they don't. They um, <laughs> they decide that what's really frightening her is nature, and specifically a lodge called Eden that they mm. have in the middle of the. Oh, nature. that's where Eden. That's where that comes from. Yeah, as as in um the metal band Eden from the seventies. Yeah, we're yeah. all thinking it. It's very clever. So they, yeah, they decide to go. And um, on, along, along the way, Willem Dafoe has Charlotte Gainsbourg visualise entering Eden, walking on the grass, yes, paying attention her. to everything. Yes. Yep. And just thoroughly feeling it before she actually does it. Yep. And it seems to work. The little tears are hiding among the ferns, as usual. Is it difficult to walk there? No. <laughs> really. He says, you know, whatever else happens now, you'll have done it. Yeah. So we can just go home? No. No. Oh, okay. No, we're still going to go rub your face in the thing you fear most. Yeah. Smother you. Because it's for your benefit. Smother you with that pillow of your son's death. (laughs) What have you got in that really stinky briefcase, by the way? Nothing. (laughs) Stinky four foot briefcase. It seems to be leaking. It's nothing, okay? Oh, it's Willem Dafoe's stinky four foot briefcase. (laughs) That's another Eden song. <laughs> it's weird because it was written before Willem Dafoe had any sort of career. It later turned into a Kirk Cameron sitcom, which, I mean, who knows what's going on with that man? It's very preachy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but nobody knows preaching of what. Anyway, they arrive at Eden and they spend some time hiking to the cabin. Yeah. But there's creepy shit afoot. Oh. We see some foliage twitching about. So he goes rooting about and sees a deer with a stillborn baby deer hanging from its rear quarters. Yeah, they decide to carry on to the cabin. Yeah. Um, Charlotte Gainsbourg freaks out and just runs for the cabin. Immersion therapy isn't quite working at this stage, but so Willem Dafoe will treble down. She's not immersed enough. Uh, <laughs> Get the VR headset out. Got to be in 3D. There's Char- Charlotte Gainsbourg sort of desperate for attention, for love, and trying to have sex with her husband. He, for the most part... Because, yeah, um, which is the only thing is- that can really break his kind of calm cold exterior yeah. and the only way she can get any sort of affection out of him they they discuss the fact that potentially Willem Dafoe has uh, not been interested in her or their son for a long time now yeah um, and that he's indifferent to whether or not the son is alive or not um, he strokes yeah. his stinky briefcase and uh, denies everything yeah and um, he decides to design an exercise in which he's going to make her walk across a little patch of grass yes so he takes her outside and gets her to do that, and she does successfully, although very tentatively, manage to walk across a tiny bit of grassland yeah. by Eden. And everything seems great. And then there's a rustling in the foliage, and oh, we've got to go check that out. I wonder what that is. Um, oh, it's a day, it's a baby bird being eaten by ants and then by torn apart by an eagle. Yeah. Anyway, back to trying to kill my wife. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, and this time it's Charlotte Gainsbourg who um, notices this, um, as opposed to Defoe, who was looking the other way. Yeah. He was looking at something even more upsetting <laughs> that happened the other direction that we didn't get to see. So, <laughs> William Defoe's <laughs> reflection in a mirror, <laughs> because he's he's such a good actor, is the thing. <laughs> so William Defoe is pretty confident that this is all working and this is good for her. So at this stage, we have a flashback to why she's afraid mm. of um, nature, and it involves her son. Hearing her son screaming out the year before when they came up just so that she could work on her thesis. She and her son came out, Gainsbourg and the son came out to work on the um, thesis all on their own without, you know, the distraction of Willem Dafoe. Who is pretty distracting. And his stinky briefcase. (laughs) What was it at that stage? It it, it doesn't really matter. He just needs to keep it stinky. It needs a sort of stinky (laughs) stinky continuum. (laughs) Constinquum? You're messing with the space-time constinquum. Yes. Well, whatever that means. Um, it turns out there was crying in the forest and she didn't understand why. She found her son not crying and yet could still hear the screams and, yeah, spoke to her. Yeah. They try to identify more what it is that's actually freaking her out about nature without success. No, she suggests yeah. maybe Satan and Willem Dafoe maybe is Satan. not pleased with this. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let's, 
There's a lot of ideas being thrown about here, love. <laughs> Let's try and keep Satan out of it for now. Let's step back from Satan for now. Defoe, I think, is just out having a bit of a walk. Mm. And he notices um, a rustling in a nearby bush. And you've got to go check that out, <laughs> haven't you, you fucking legend? <laughs> what well, could it with be? With track record. Could be a treat. <laughs> a rustling treat. <laughs> Rustl- one of my rustling treats. <laughs> and he goes Rilla out. Defoe and... eats the rustling treats. <laughs> yeah. That's my concept <laughs> album. Says... That's my next concept album. <laughs> Willem Defoe eats the rustling treats. Seven hours long. There's a children's book, Tired, as well, which is very upsetting. <laughs> I we meant to listen to one whilst reading the other. No, don't do fucking that. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. I can't even imagine. <laughs> Got fucking death wish, child. <laughs> what? I don't understand you, Northern Dad. You don't have to understand me. <laughs> just, just eat me. Anyway, it's a fox <laughs> eating itself. So back at the cabin. <laughs> sure is. Chaos reigns. Back at the cabin, he finds her journal in the attic, which is all about witch hunts and um, a scrapbook in which her thesis her writing... is on genocide. It should be mentioned. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and also her thesis is a scrapbook, as was mine, yeah. incidentally. Uh, it was rejected <laughs> by everywhere. <laughs> it was all about mining class, though, so I don't, I don't know what point I was trying to make. I just, I wrote, I wrote bitch on every page. And um, I, didn't, I didn't get any sort of degree, but I did get funding from the Arts Council, which doesn't exist anymore. So <laughs> I think it was a moral victory. That's all a coincidence, anyway. <laughs> it was unrelated to the mining class book. <laughs> We just did it because they liked the way I was living my life. <laughs> Let's fuck Little this. did they know. Little <laughs> did they know. That might but you liked Antichrist. Oh. oh, no. Anti-class. Um, anyway, the man repro- uh, goes down and is like, hey, what's all this about, love? And she's like, well, you know how they burnt women for hundreds of years? The, the sheer amount of stuff that just oppresses women. Mm. Yeah. Well, maybe it's right. What? If human nature is evil, then that goes as well as the nature of... Of the women, female nature. Women do not control their own bodies. Nature does. I have it in writing in my books. The literature that you used in your search was about evil things committed against women, but you read it as proof of the evil of women? You were supposed to be critical of those texts. That was your thesis. Instead, you're embracing it. Do do you know what you're saying? Forget it. I don't know why I said it. That's awful. Only a ridiculous, (laughs) ridiculous woman would think something like that was true. Um, I'm sorry. You fucking should be. I (laughs) hate you. Shit. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna (laughs) withdraw all affection from you. So she has a sex at him, which obviously works. Yeah. But um, now that she's got the added layer of self-loathing, uh, she asks him to hit her so that it hurts, uh, which she doesn't want to do. He only wants to verbally abuse her. So she runs off to go have a bit of a masturbate in the forest, as we all do. As we all yep. do, guys. Come on. Yep, she leans up against a big old oak and starts fingering herself quite yep. aggressively. <laughs> And Willem, yeah. Willem Dafoe comes in and says, allow me to do that with my penis. <laughs> and and so they have sex and he hits her a, a few times and um, sex goes off successfully. At the same time, there is there are it pans out there are a number of limbs of uh, dead women. Yeah, I think so. Pale hands sort of reaching yeah. out from the trees, curving around them. Yes. Uh, which they don't notice. No. No, they get, look, if there's one thing we can learn, it's that these guys really are into sex. Yeah. There's all sorts, all sorts can go on around them, and they're just not gonna, they're not gonna clock it. Whatever the weather. (laughs) You have to wonder at what point they did realise the sun had fallen out of the window. Was it a neighbour, sort of, Um, uh, is this yours? Oh, God. (laughs) No! (laughs) God. The next morning, I think... Defoe notices something, um, which is that he still has the autopsy report from his son in his pocket. Mm. Opening up, he realizes that 
the mortician identified that there was a um, slight deformation in his feet. Otherwise, the yes. death was completely unsuspicious, and they're not going to continue the case. He goes and has a look and notices that Gainsbourg actually put the wrong shoes on mm. their son several times. Yes, right foot on the left, left foot on the right, as opposed yeah. to espadrilles when he really needed desert boots. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this is obviously clearly suspicious, so she confronts him with it. Uh, he, he confronts, confronts her. her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She confronts herself and yeah. feigns ignorance. You know, just a brain fart. Yeah. Happens to yeah. all of us, guys. Huh. Just back off. Yeah. But um, he decides that actually the thing that she's really afraid of is herself and the evil within herself. At which point, let's let, let's let's just wrap it up, shall we? Yeah, At which okay. point, she she runs in, whacks him over the head with a log, has sex with him, and um, as they're having sex, she gets up, claiming yep. that he's planning to run away, yep. hits him in the balls with a big log. He's a red cock. He's a red cock, which causes him yep. to pass out from the pain. She wanks him off whilst he's unconscious, causing him to ejaculate blood. Mm-hmm. She drills a hole in his leg, puts a wheel through it so that he can't move yeah. around very well. Yeah. Um, but he does actually move around quite well in spite of that when he wakes up. And he he hides in a vaginal looking cave where hopefully he'll finally be free from his wife. Then there's a rustling. Oh. You gotta go check that out. <laughs> this is gonna be the treat, isn't it? This one's the treat. Finally my treat, he says. It's a... T- <laughs> Tell you what, bloody hell, I've earned it today. <laughs> God, I haven't even really taken time out to really appreciate how much my penis hurts. <laughs> I was too busy worrying about the big wheel drilled through my leg. <laughs> I really hope this is a Mars bar. <laughs> time to take a break. Isn't that the weirdest Snickers advert you've ever seen? <laughs> Not yourself when you're hungry. <laughs> anyway, there's actually a... Horrible emaciated crow down there that he has to try and beat to death with his bare hands. Yeah. Unsuccessfully. He's rubbish at it. Yeah. No experience. No technique. He... No, he's crap. He hits the bird, what, 50? 58 times? <laughs> he keeps crawing. And it only takes Charlotte Gainsbourg about 20 minutes to realise where he is. He's yeah. up the foxhole, so he drags him out. She drags, She digs him out. Brings yeah. him back to the cabin um, and prepares to murder him. Because when the three beggars show up, which is the fox, the deer, and the crow, then yep. someone has to die. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm reading the Wikipedia at the same time. Uh, this is about as good... Uh, I'll just read the Wikipedia for this bit. <laughs> In a flashback, she watches Nick climbing up to the window, but she does not act, thus displaying her essential evil, um, much like her ap- hypothesis. In the cabin, she cuts off her clitoris with scissors... They are visited by a crow, the deer, and the fox. A hailstorm begins. Earlier it had been revealed that women accused of witchcraft had been known to have the power to summon hailstorms. I didn't actually put that together. Thank you, Wikipedia. Finding the wrench under the floorboards, he is stabbed with, by her with the scissors. So he is able to unbolt the guidestone. Yeah. Finally, he's free. Um, he shows a vicious face <laughs> and strangles her to death and then burns Oof. on a funeral pyre. Yeah. And then he goes into the woods. Yeah, he goes into the woods. Um, Von Trier cranks the um, handle He uh, back up. He cranks the handle! <laughs> that is amazing. You're such a genius. <laughs> <laughs> he cranks up the handle. And yeah, um, as he's ascending the woods, eating some wild berries, he notices the three beggars again, meaning that someone else has to die. Um, and yeah, a whole bunch of women with blurred faces and old clothing appear coming towards him. Uh, probably to just give him a good old handshake and congratulate him on having strangled Charlotte Gaines board to death. One of them has a Mars bar. It's all going to be fine. Ah, oh, well. That was Antichrist. Yeah, okay, well, that was quite a ride, Paul. Uh, it sure was. So what do you think about this? I love it. It's one of my favourite horror films ever made. Okay. Um, Probably up there in a top tier along with uh, The Shining and The Exorcist. Just mm. in terms of the best of horror cinema certainly is a horror film it certainly is in spite of what von trier keeps saying that it's not really a horror film and you know he just set out to make one but failed in Mm. the same way he set out to make a musical with uh dancer in the dark but failed no no it's a fucking horror film sir and i suspect that dancer in the dark is something of a horror film as well (laughs) <laughs> and that you could set out to make a children's film and end up making a bit of a horror film. I, th- I think what I what I love about it a lot is that 
um, it, I mean, it comes from a, it comes out of a, a, a very depressed and troubled mind, and it was written yeah. when he was in a very bad place, almost bedridden with, with yeah. uh, angst and, and depression. Yes. And you can sort of see that in. There's a little bit of messiness throughout throughout the film in, in, in some of the ideas maybe, and in the way some of it is presented, and it's very easy mm. to relate to, um, as 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 yes, somebody who's had. Who sort of struggled with those things? It's it's immediately relatable. Yeah, no, that, that is the thing is he did put a tremendous amount of himself into it, and yeah. in terms of it being messy, uh, he himself said that he was at about forty percent capacity yeah, when making exactly. the film. Um, and couldn't hold a camera. He couldn't operate the camera, which is what he likes yeah. to do, and so his director of photography had to try and mimic the way in which Von Trier moves his camera. But uh, to me, that's just the part of the dissonance of it, part of the effect. Yeah. It's just. It's utterly disorientating and it's gorgeously filmed. You can you can split yeah. the shots of the film into two camps. One of them is incredibly carefully planned and realized yeah. beautifully staged shots with wonderful staging and incredible visuals. And the other is this incredibly natural and kind of messy Dogma 95 mm. style uh, dialogue yes. scenes with chopped out um, frames and unmotivated zooms. Um, and stuff like that, and the effect of these two things together, first of all, they blend seamlessly together. It, it really has the effect of just changing the center of gravity in the film at a drop of a hat. Yeah, there are a few things that go on at once for me. One of them is the the way that it's cut, for me, yeah. gives the it sometimes gives the feeling of going through a dream. It's, it's yes. just, just like Inception, it's missing just enough mm. of a transition from scene to scene to make it mm. pass as though it's kind of not really under your control the landscapes yeah. in it uh every frame of these landscapes are a painting they are yeah. stunning they are incredible yeah. with the slowest moving like mists rolling across mm. the grass or oh god yeah there's there's one particular shot of just the landscape of the rolling mm. hills with the trees covering the mountains that pretty much winded me it was incredible yeah. and then at the same time when it when like you said you get to the dogma 95 stuff when it's up close and personal, it's mm. vividly, palpably oppressive. Everything yeah. about it and the relationship, the like the power struggle between Willem Dafoe and Charlotte yeah. Gainsbourg is so well realized. For for me, it makes for a very upsetting viewing experience. Right. I don't I don't mean that in a in a way that this film shouldn't be watched. I mean that it just it affected me. Absolutely. And there's something hypnotic about it as well. The sort of the kind of monotone, dreamlike way in which both of them deliver their lines, the swaying of the camera, the mm -hmm. the choppiness of it, it does it has the weird effect of kind of lulling me into it to a feeling of helplessness as it plays out. In terms of it being a horror film, the moments of horror that there are that I mean the whole thing is just so un unnerving. The soundtrack as well is just this beautiful off putting, <laughs> um dissonant sound and sort of composed yeah. of drones and uh, it, in the in the um, special feature about the making of the music, they show that they did weird things to make those sounds, like blowing on various reeds of glass or grass or um, oh, wow. sort of crunching, okay. crunching tree bark, and then slowing <laughs> it down and repeating itself. And even they got the guy to swallow a microphone, and they recorded <laughs> his internal sounds, and then sort of oh, man. played that on top of itself to make that happen and then they played that over the scenes where she was being put under it added just infinite menace i think to that yeah to, to those moments my boiler actually earlier was making a, a slight high whistling sound very reminiscent of the sound they play whenever something spooky lunges out of the undergrowth Ooh. and it scared the living shit out of me <laughs> watch out for the foxes <laughs> they're behind yeah. you yeah they're gonna do something upsetting <laughs> so one thing about the horror i, I must say is in this film, nothing is out to get you in the woods. Nothing's out to yeah. do you harm. That's not yeah. what the jump scares are about. They're going to do you psychological harm. Yes. Nature is waiting around you in order to show you something upsetting. Whether mm. that's, you know, some awful proof that nature just doesn't care about life. Or, yeah. you know, some sort of insidious thing. Like if you leave your hand on a windowsill, shit's going to grow on it. You know, so don't yeah. do that. The second you leave any appendage outside of the cabin nature's just gonna have it <laughs> 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 yeah it's and it's very like that horror is so much more believable just like with comedy yeah. working because you believe the characters it's so much more believable yeah. because these are two so very well realized characters yes their, their relation their relationship is 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 
suffocating but at the same time there are some tender moments there which are so mm. believable that it just adds to the misery because yeah i mean the second time around yeah they need each other and i knew you know i knew eventually what was going to happen and i just you can see how fragile those tender moments are yeah when those fleeting moments of happiness mm -hmm. um it's also it's also very very believable is a the thing <laughs> there's a moment it, early on when she's in the hospital and she asks him will it just go oh, no 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 no, it'll change. I so wanted to believe him. <laughs> it felt so yeah. much for her in that yeah. moment. And I was absolutely heartbroken because I knew where this was all going. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing, Paul. It's a really sort of riveting, incredible experience. I wonder why everyone didn't think that. It's a very good question. I think we can split <laughs> it into three sections, really. Ooh, um, lovely. Three main, Pain, three main arguments. misery, and... <laughs> <laughs> Parenthesis, <laughs> genocide, despair. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Well, lots to look forward to. You know, okay, well, that does fit quite nicely into it. I guess you've got um, misery, um, so too depressing, number one. Okay. Is ever one of the complaints about this is it's too dark, too miserable. Why would you want to watch it? Hmm. Act the activist and journalist Julie Bindel wrote, Watching this film was like having bad sex with someone you loathe. A hideous combination of sheer boredom and disgust. I hated it, and I hate the director for making it. <laughs> so, Von Trier was depressed a while back, had nightmares, and decided to write the script of this atrocity as a form of therapy. Therapy. Couldn't he have kept it to himself? Yeah, which is His such therapy. a therapy. Fucking... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that therapy that you're having. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad it's working, but could you not mention it? Ever. Yeah, because you keep it to yourself, so none of the rest it of us can feel sad. have any sort of similar catharsis as a result. Yeah. It's, it's insane, and I think that you do have to address the authenticity. Gillian Waring, the conceptual artist, said, This is the only film I have seen that clearly seems directed by someone with mental health issues. And I don't say that in a negative way, I think it's mm. genius. I rarely come out of a film feeling that I have experienced anything out of life. But Antichrist shows you depression, dislocation, and des desperation. And the fabulous YouTuber Nerdwriter um, said something similar about Melancholia, that he felt it was the only film he had ever seen that actually captured what it feels like to be anxious and depressed. Yeah. One of the most common forms of mental health issue in, in the world. Um, and, you know, so many people experience this, and to have a film that actually accurately captures it must be fraught for people who come to it to watch mm. it, but... Also, there's a fabulous catharsis to seeing someone experiencing something that you're experiencing as well. And even though it's a very nihilistic film that ultimately ends in the death of its depressive character, just seeing those emotions explored can help you mm. not feel alone. And my understanding of depression is the loneliness is such a terrifying part of it. This film sure. feels like you're inside the head of somebody going through this. And mm. when I was when I was watching it, I had this image at all times of Lars von Trier in a dark room just screaming and crying when mm. like for the dura the duration of this you can really really feel the pain he's going through mm. and it must and and you know what it you know what it's like when you've been in a dark room screaming for several hours on end <laughs> and ev yeah. eventually you sort of you're tired you've got you've almost got like a post orgasm uh, like relief because <laughs> you're just so worn out and yeah um you know just I, I imagine that's the case but, and and I can, imagine I can, that's I can the imagine... case after orgasm <laughs> <laughs> not had one yet but <laughs> looks great but, according to Will yeah. and I, I I feel that catharsis I feel every mm. inch every like yeah. scratch and like cut and every bit of bruising and torn skin of that catharsis yeah Ask, asking like saying to somebody can you keep it to your, yourself the issue is that yeah. nobody is forcing you to watch this film Antichrist <laughs> that's the thing you know a film or an album a poem a story hmm. um, a painting all, all of this as a self-expression is something that it, it doesn't have to go any further than the artist. All you have to do is not watch it. How, you know, you wouldn't say to somebody, go up to somebody who was suicidal and say, ah, keep it to yourself. Well, exactly. That's the thing. And there were so many people. And I'm, I'm amazed that someone could watch this and not relate to some of it. I mean, yeah. it's so visceral and it's so all-encompassing that... I'm amazed that someone could watch it and not find something that they can actually relate to. But mm -hmm. even if you can't, others definitely can. And for them, it mm. will be as therapeutic to watch it as it was for Von Trier to have made it. Because like, we, like we've said, this really did kind of put him back on his feet. Before this, yeah. he wasn't sure if he ever wanted to make a film again. And subsequently, he's made some of the best films of his career. Um, yeah. 
and it and was I mean, necessary it, for this. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think isn't this one of those cases like with um too, too pretentious, too long, too depressing. Yeah. All all of these things. Is it worth like engaging in why why you felt that and mm. and what the issue is with something being too depressing? Needs more needs more engagement. I think is <laughs> hey, absolutely. Back to that. The fact that this mm. is a horror film is interesting because a lot of people don't understand the appeal of horror films. You know why come to something where you're just going to watch horrible things happen to people? Why would you want that in your head? But yeah. horror films are about fear. It's about exp- exposing yourself to your fears in a safe environment and mm. therefore exploring them. You know, it's kind of like immersion therapy, except you're not actually throwing yourself into yeah. them. If you're anxious because you're afraid of other people, you're afraid of being out alone at night, watching a slasher film far from sort of confirming all of your fears can actually be quite cathartic by exploring it, looking at it and realizing this is absurd. Mm. It's crazy. So you can be less afraid of it. And by seeing something that so accurately captures your own feelings of depression, loneliness, fear, it can help normalize it. Because if someone else feels it, then it's it's not so isolating. It's not so unique to you. And it's not exactly. so powerful. Exactly. It's not only helpful to Lars von Trier, it's helpful to mm. so many people who have suffered from um, uh, depression or anxiety or... Mm self-worth issues or anything yeah. fear of something I, th- I think i think where too depressing is concerned i think we've we've addressed that kind of argument before and i think you've pretty much you pretty much solved that one so we should we move mm. on to pain sure absolutely okay pain so sticking with the julie bindle argument article <laughs> yay she writes it's as bad as if not worse than the old video nasty films of the mm. 80s such as i spit on your grave or dress to kill against which i campaigned as a young feminist I love gangster movies, serial killer novels and such like, but for me, they have to contribute to our understanding of why such cruelty and brutality is inflicted by some people on others, rather than for the purposes of gruesome entertainment. If I am to watch a woman's clitoris being hacked off, I want it to contribute to my understanding of female genital mutilation, not just allow me to see the inside of a woman's vagina. Now, there are many issues with this. So many issues. For one thing, you can't actually see inside that well. Quite dimly lit. No, yeah. If you come for an anatomy lesson... You're not, yeah. you're not going to get much out of it. No, this is... Last one, Trier never, ever stated that that's what this film was. <laughs> it, it, it's it, That's definitely not what this is. It's not intended to just be a slasher flick. And I'd like to just, first of all, defend 80s slasher films and video nasties by saying that the whole video nasties thing really threw the baby out with the bathwater because for every anthropophagus that you dispelled, you got rid of something genuinely provocative and interesting like the Driller Killer. And there's dozens of examples of that from that era. And what's more, there's a, a new wave of sort of feminist critics who are saying that actually a lot of these old slasher films of the 80s were feminist because they portray women in a survival mode mm. and it urges the audience to empathize with them and not with their killers. And that's something that not a lot of other genres were doing. You know, women in action movies tended to be the, you know, the love interests or, you know, mm. the foils or the collateral damage, if anything else. Whereas in horror films, intelligent women had to figure out their way out of dangerous situations. So, yeah, I, now, I reject what... that definition, first of yeah. all. So now what do you think of the, the statement? Uh, I love violence, but for me, it has to contribute to our understanding of why such cruelty and brutality is inflicted by some people on others, rather than the pu- for the purposes of gruesome entertainment. Well, in terms of gruesome entertainment, Willem Dafoe said, if we wanted to shock people, we could have done a lot more. And I think that's definitely yeah. true. And um, it's it's a thread that's picked up by um, Joanna Bork, the professor of history at Birkbeck College, who says the, viol- the violence is defiantly excessive and beautiful. But it is not designer violence, intended to Mm. appall and titillate in the same breath. Neither does it inspire compassion. Von Trier simply presents cruelty as there, serving to no liberating function for the audience. Pain, its infliction, and its suffering is integral to life. And that's what it's fucking saying about violence, is the idea that nature is full of it. So if you want to tell a story about how, oh shit, wouldn't it be scary if really there was absolutely nothing more to us than our inner nature and that it's just as savage and awful as the stuff you see on the nature documentaries, how are you going to tell that story without what two people literally hacking each other up? Mm-hmm. Because that oh. is the barbarity he's trying to expose. I mean, for, for all that um, Judy Bindle said in this article, it does contribute to our understanding of why such yeah. cruelty and brutality is inflicted by some people on others. It, um, it does. The, the, the film spends an awful lot of time going into this. Yeah. 
I'd like I'd like to then just move on to something that Dana Stevens wrote for Slate. Right. The last 20 minutes are horrifically violent, relentlessly claustrophobic, and irredeemably pointless. Von Trier has us on the hot seat, and he's going to walk us through his most primitive sexual nightmares, not because they'll bring us to a greater understanding of madness or love or grief, but just because he bloody well feels like it. Yeah. And this plays into that whole thing of Lars von Trier as a joker, as a trickster director, with his tongue firmly in cheek, as the, the quote is, usually goes. Yeah, and just trying to piss people off just for the sake of pissing mm. people off, which I think is problematic because that is what he does in real life. <laughs> and you can actually see yes. it. You can see in interviews, if someone comes to him with a hostile, you know, a, a hostile intent, he's going to dismiss you sort of sardonically. And that's how he reacts to things. And I think that behavior, which he exhibits in interviews, um, has led people to dismiss his films as just being elaborate provocation uh, provocation but it's provocation yeah. with a purpose yeah i mean in a safer safer environment he has famously mm. said that he doesn't joke with his films no. they are they are completely and utterly sincere i mean and as and as for too violent i think i think mm. once once again as as something that is it's not actually mm. hurting other people that there, there is the the sort of well-worn trite mm. argument about well you know it's it it tells people the wrong things and you know you're going to be influencing people to to think that that's it's not but again it's sure. not the responsibility of the artist mm. to think about the person that goes to see see their film um you know if and if and if that were truly the case then the saw film should maybe come under questioning for for that kind sure. of thing if, if 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 influencing people really is really is the issue you know yeah I mean, um, it's interesting that the film actually kind of it actually kind of interrogates that thinking as well because there's a moment where william defoe says to um charlotte um charlotte yes <laughs> gainsbourg uh gainsbourg that um your fears aren't real they can't mm. hurt you and then by the end her fears have influenced her to hurt him so I think Von Trier knows that fear, when uh, pr uh, sufficiently indulged, can lead to violent behavior, and that's sort of what he's saying with the film. So if anything, it's kind of it's kind of vindicating some of these arguments against it, and mm. put, in the same way that Michelle Haneke made a slasher film in order to rail against slasher films, you know, mm. maybe he is saying with this, there's a, definitely a reading there that if you do spend too much time dwelling in the sort of um, violence of the past and the sort of violence that upsets you the most you might end up doing it to others and maybe that's not true and that's the thing about von trier is every time he asserts anything in an interview he'll say afterwards maybe i'm wrong maybe that's not true yeah um but he wants to use his films to explore the ideas and he wants to explore his fears and maybe the fear that someone might watch his films and become violent as a result is one of the things he wants to explore but you know, if that's if he's doing that for himself, I'd rather he just kept it to himself. You know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. We'd like to we like to say it to him. We don't want him saying it about himself. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Then it's a very hot day in Melbourne today. I am starting to sweat, so maybe it's a good time to talk about misogyny. <laughs> Lars, Lars von Trier has been called a misogynist uh, after Breaking the Waves, uh, mm. a film where supposedly Emily, Emily Watson fucks her way to heaven. Um, as, he, as he himself explains it. Yeah, um, Dance, Dancer in the Dark, where Bjork claimed that she was emotionally molested by Lars von Trier. And, okay. of course, now finally Antichrist. Not finally, I feel, and fear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did Nymphomaniac not have any form of backlash? Um, it it probably did, but it was, I mean, a lot of it was probably because of the unsimulated yeah. sex and, and, and things <laughs> and like the that. unsimulated use of Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> yes. Um, not his cock, though. Oh. <laughs> it was it was it was digitally <laughs> altered. <laughs> it was Charlotte Gaines Bros. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Tukey for the Mail Online writes Of all his films, Antichrist is the most openly psychopathically hostile towards women. Psychopathically. <laughs> the creepy implication is that somehow she and her child are being punished for her taking pleasure in sex. This is the first hint of misogyny, but it certainly isn't the last. He then goes on to criticise the film classification board for being mavericks, for being completely unaccountable <laughs> to the public because the offence caused by a film should be held on a level with real-life misogynistic acts perpetrated by, I don't know, real-life members of the film industry. But <laughs> in, in, yeah. in, 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 fa in fairness to him, he does concede that this is not torture porn and, it's, it, but he, and he right. elevates it above things like hostile and, um, and, and sore for it not being voyeuristic. But the man who wrote that then about the misogyny and about how the classification boards needs to be tighter on protecting the public from things that are morally unpleasant 
He then went back to his desk at the Daily Mail. <laughs> Into a building where people can correctly and accurately answer the phone by saying, yes, this is the Daily Mail. <laughs> yeah, the reactionary nationalist one, yeah. Believe it yeah. or not. <laughs> yeah, the one that ran the headline, 4,000 foreign murderers and rapists we can't throw out, and yes, the, you can blame the Human Rights Act. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's us. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, How many days ones... till our 18th birthday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're the ones who regularly run articles that exaggerate the number of fraudulent benefits claimants stoking disabledist attitudes. That's us. Yeah. You, you've got yeah. you've got the right number, don't worry. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we pay paparazzi to invasively pho- photograph celebrities at funerals and hospitals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. We're, Wikipedia doesn't accept us as a reliable source anymore. No. No, we keep faking <laughs> interviews and figures. Look, do you have an extension I could put you through to? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's us, the Daily Mail. How can I help? Most widely read newspaper in Britain. Uh, oh, oh, they've shot themselves again. <laughs> another Got another shooter, Barry. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that's allegations of misogyny from a man, so... Yeah. Well, just to um, sum up, sorry, fuck that guy's moral authority. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't, doesn't have a leg to stand on. So, obviously, we can't invalidate anyone's claim of sexism on this. Mm. If someone genuinely felt that way, you know, we're not going to talk them out of it. And I, I I personally will admit to being a little concerned about sounding condescending on this. You know, I'm happy to condescend to the Daily Mail. Fuck those guys. But I don't want to make it seem like I'm saying, oh, love, you weren't... It's not really misogynist. Let me explain why. You know, mm. it's... We're going to offer some counter evidence here, but nor are we going to hide behind the comments of other women, but we're hoping to have a full-on conversation about the misogyny or potential misogyny of Antichrist from our admittedly somewhat limited perspective. For sure. Um, I don't think that you can say definitively that this film is or isn't misogynist because I yes. can't. you can't turn around to somebody who feels offended somebody who's taken offence and, and feels that this is a misogynist film, you can't turn around to that person and say, that's not misogynist, <laughs> because you, 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 know, you don't know. It's like you can't turn around and say, oh, what I, sa- what I said wasn't just racist, because it's not, you know, it's not up to yeah. you, and it's not up to me what other people find misogynist or, or not. But yeah, yeah I, th- I think um, just, just, just like the film, the ability to have a discussion about this is really important. Yeah, and I'd like to just come out right now and say that my definitive approach to whether or not Antichrist is a misogynist film is I'm not sure mm-hmm. but I think it's still valid anyway <laughs> mm. it's maybe but still watch it yeah I think it's to to everyone's detriment to actually not watch this film and engage in what is and isn't mm. misogynistic Lars von Trier himself mm. dis- describes a, a lot of the sort of the, the 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 beliefs in this film that could be mm. seen as misogynistic as nonsense. I think that's certainly true. It's just that he wants to interrogate things, and he's not afraid of bad taste. And he wants yes. to just explore people's hang-ups and taboos. And maybe he's not the best qualified person to do that because he's not terribly <laughs> nuanced. But yes, he there is a sincere effort there to just want to interrogate the things that we all assume. Are correct. I think um, you're right. It's the way in which he explores these things. He's, mm. as as he famously famously said, he provokes himself. Yeah, he's asking questions of himself as well as mm. everyone else. But it seems primarily that he's asking questions of himself. He's addressing questions that he has about feminism and about yeah. um and about misogyny and and things like that. And I mean, there there's a reading from this film when you know it's pretty much on the surface reading about how bizarre and un- unreal it is for her to have gone to the, the woods to write her thesis on genocide yeah. and then suddenly become very troubled by yeah. the, his- the, his- the history of misogyny and starts mm. to think, well, maybe, you know, maybe women should be blamed. And I think that yeah. is the, that's the effect of um, a misogynist society. And I think when mm. you look at uh, Nymphomaniac, which is an- another one which does sort of t- toe this line, not only do I think it's a fairly empowering film for Charlotte Gainsbourg, Charlotte Gainsbourg's character, yeah. but it is also very much a story told about a character who grows up in an inherently misogynist society. Yes, and, and there's I, definitely he... support for that idea. You've got people like Karina Longworth, who's also writing for Slate, interestingly, um, mm. explaining why Antichrist is a feminist horror film. Before I had a chance right. to see it, a male reporter for a major newspaper told me that no woman could possibly enjoy the film. 
And that really <laughs> reminded me of Victoria Corrin Mitchell, who said of Nocturnal Animals that it was a disgusting little film that only male critics enjoy, whereas a um yeah a cursory fucking Google, uh, if not any common sense, a cursory Google would have said there were plenty of women who enjoyed Nocturnal Animals who didn't share yeah. the same complaints. I think you're just causing disaster when you try and speak for all of women, um, especially when you're not one, but also when you are one. <laughs> <laughs> just don't yeah. in general um <laughs> but anyone who takes the time to grapple uh, she continues sorry anyone who takes the time to grapple with what von trier has put on screen should find a film that's far too complex to be dismissed as merely sexist and kate hagan writing for her blog 31 days of feminist horror reinforces what we just said there it's easy to classify antichrist as anti-women i certainly did upon my first watch but further thoughts mm. about the film's themes and about defoe as emblematic as the failures of, a, of the patriarchy as a whole proves that Von Trier's film is indeed an indictment of male power structures that have been oppressed, sorry, that have oppressed, abused, and killed women since the dawn of time. Gainsbourg's mm. She has been so corrupted by the patriarchy that she turns societal male hatred inwards and begins hating herself and believing that all women yeah. are evil because men, especially her husband, have constantly told her that such a thing is true. Yeah he's incredibly oppressive and I, I remember him as almost the the, the villain if you yeah. could have such a thing in this film ebert had an interesting read on that saying he is controlling mm. dominant personality who i believe is moved by the traumatic death to punish the woman who delivered his child into the mm. world i don't think that's quite it because i think that's too specific that way mm. he's kind of led off because it's like revenge i think it's yeah. more insidious than that i think he just treats her the way he does because he thinks that's the best way to treat a person you know he's a therapist yeah. and he believes the best way to deal with problematic emotions is to try and fix them and he does that yeah. by utterly demeaning her actual feelings and not being interested in actually listening to her i mean it's a full-on mansplain isn't it yeah there's no there's nothing that says that they're in a happy relationship before this there's nothing that says no. that things were going fine before this and if it <laughs> well, could be the opposite a continuation yeah she says you were treating me very cold last coldly last yeah. year you were very indifferent to us it's we're definitely yeah. shown that they are on the edge, you know, yeah. before the sun even approaches the window. Yeah, I, so I think it's wrong to to say that all of this is tri triggered by the gr the death of their son. Yeah, aggravated. Um, and again, it over it oversimplifies it. Mm. Um, I have uh, I do have a, a a conclusion to an article by Batia Ungar mm. Sargon. Uh, just excuse my white middle class pronunciation <laughs> of your name. So why do we put up with it? Why do critics laud him? Instead of looking for ways to forgive Von Trier yet again for his disgust with all things female and his complete and inexplicable confusion regarding female anatomy and pleasure, why not instead demand more from our art? The thing is, I did at one stage feel like I was trying to vindicate because I loved mm. Antichrist not for its interrogation of gender politics, but for its atmosphere, for its powerful performances, stunning visuals and utter mm. power as a horror film. That's why I loved it. And then someone comes along and says, hey, you know, that's misogynist, right? And it's like, what? And I'm like, no, it's not because, 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 and I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for reasons yeah. why. So I, I can relate to her frustration of why do critics keep scrambling to forgive him? Um, yeah. But that when it's not much of a scramble when you read some of these really well thought out arguments. It's difficult because it's a very emotional discussion. And if, and if you do feel like, like, I can only imagine what it would be like what it must be like to be a woman living today. Yeah. I was walking down the street the other day and I was about 10 meters behind uh, a woman who was walking down and a, a, like a, a tradie van just slowed down, honked at her waved, and waved when she turned around yeah. and, and then just yeah. picked up speed. And I just felt pretty dirty Yeah, <laughs> within just pretty rotten all, all throughout. So it, it's, it's, Constant it's, shit. it's, yeah, it's everywhere and we're not going to, save all the women by having by just the two of us having this discussion but mm. i think in ter in terms of the film it's such an interesting film from a such an interesting yeah. troubled man who has his history of making these provocative films even beyond asking other people to have this discussion about it he's asking it of himself and yeah. the, the i think the most beneficial thing we can do is just join in on that discussion i just want to share the charlotte gainsborough quote that she said when she said that she finds it really unjust that people say he hates women, I really have the impression that I was playing him, that he was the woman and that I was going through that misery, the physical condition and the panic attacks. Charlotte Gainsbourg's character of her, I mean, we should we haven't actually said she won um, Best Actress Award at Cannes Film Festival mm. for her performance. That's the point, though, is she is the most sympathetic character in the film. 
She really is. Like, her angst, her pain is so much more relatable than Defoe with his sort of unrelenting logic and need to pick apart her problems with this um, sort of reason that he has. It's it's so cold that we're, we're definitely made to be on Gainsborough's side, which is what makes it so upsetting when our vehicle mm. in this world suddenly goes off the road and suddenly reveals that she's got all of these um, alarming beliefs. But really those beliefs are that she's terrified that her own nature is wrong. And they've gendered it by making her female and making it female nature. And they've you know, found lots of support for that in various historical documents. But really, it's just a fear of being out of control. And mm. that's something that really affects Von Trier. I'm going to share with you um, an interview with Von Trier by um, Virginie Salavi. And you can forgive my pronunciation, but she's the <laughs> editor of Electric Sheep, which is a brilliant publication that seeks to be an alternative, um, subversive approach to film criticism. Here's the back and forth. You said in a previous interview that female sexuality is frightening. Is that the kind of fear that you personally confronted through the film? Yeah, but if it was only that, I, I think I could cope. Um, I think it's more complicated. Basically, you're afraid of chaos and lack of control and death. That's the basis of everything. So why did you say that? I think female sexuality is frightening even to the female. <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about you. Mm, yes, I don't think I am frightened. But as a little boy, when you find out your penis can become erect, that's extremely frightening. I'm sure there must be some parallel thing f for girls. Um, but yeah, I, maybe I'm wrong. I'm frightened of almost everything in life, so... There seems to be the idea in the film that evil comes from women's sexuality. I think that's a little excessive. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think that sexuality is the part of human beings that is closest to nature, and... Nature is dangerous somehow, yes. If you put nature against civilization, nature is definitely a threat. And you feel that women are closer to nature than men? <laughs> you know, the reason I make films is so that I don't have to answer questions like that. Um, yes, maybe somehow I feel that, but not in a negative way. So, hmm. what's to be gleaned from that? <laughs> von Trier on Von Trier there. We, we've, we've covered a lot of his own sort of neuroses yeah. and um, the, way, the way that he works, asking questions of himself. Mm. I mean, what that says to me is that he is he is a troubled guy who who wanders a lot. Yeah, he spends a lot of time in his own head. Yeah, that yeah. maybe a, a lot of people would only think abstractly without putting words to it. Mm. He also has no qualms about speaking his mind about the things that he thinks about, about yeah. sharing these things, mm. which a lot of people wouldn't necessarily do. Yeah, and it could go one of two ways. You could have an interviewer, I think, who who accepts that and says, okay, well, that's very interesting. Let's have a discussion or one who sort of shuts him down or picks on a, a particular thing he says and yeah. tries to sort of rail it in that direction. Mm. Because uh, one of the things he said in the documentary is he thinks it's ridiculous to say that women are more evil than men, just as it's ridiculous to say that men are more evil than women, you know, with the yeah. same, with the same levels of evil inside of all of us, which is according to him quite substantial. So what's to be made of his, comments here that women are closer to nature and nature is the thing that scares him the most I, is it just as i suspect that the fear of otherness and he just describes that to women in this case ultimately there'll be a lot of people who dis who disagree quite vehemently with that and a lot of people who might be interested then in seeing the film with the uh, sorry disagree vehemently with anything that he might say regarding regarding women because sure. he doesn't he's not qualified to speak about yeah. women um, but the, the the fact remains that he is just asking questions about that. And as you said, yeah. he does sort of tend to suffix everything that he says with... I don't know. Well, I, I could be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think the the important thing is here to try and encourage people to, to watch it. Yeah. And see and see for themselves and, and in, c continue that discussion with uh, old Lars himself. <laughs> I think it's a film about a woman who is terrified of nature. And she ends up fearing the nature inside of her, and it's all really a coda for Von Trier, who fears his own nature, and the nature, the nature of the people around him, including the women around Freudian him. Freudian slip. <laughs> Nietzschean slip. Sorry. <laughs> Damn it. The nature around him. <laughs> um, the nature of people around him, including the women, but especially the therapists. Um, both of whom he seems to depend upon. Like, he talks about how supportive his wife is, and how much he depends on his therapist, but... I think his biggest fear is that his fear will lead him to hurt those people, just as she ends up doing. And this resonated with me for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I am terrified of nature. Um, I've mentioned this before, and I actually recalled something that I hadn't thought about in maybe two decades during my prep for this. Like, I, this genuinely came out of nowhere. I was very young, 
a toddler, I think, and they had these paving slabs in my garden that just sat on top of the soil and the earth. They weren't, like, concreted in. So I, I had it in my head, my little toddler head, to try and lift one. And I remember standing on one end to make the other end come up, and then I slipped my little fingers underneath, and I pulled it towards me. And then I let it sort of fall backwards. And then I looked at the spot where it had been laid in the ground and immediately felt sick. <laughs> hundreds upon hundreds of wood lice. Yeah. Also worms and maybe even a centipede, depending on how much my childhood imagination has <laughs> amplified this. All just hanging out down there, doing whatever mm-hmm. it is they do, feeling the need to hide whatever that is from the gaze of God, um, whom I had previously assumed had loved me. Um, it freaked me out. It, the, yeah. the idea that behind the pleasant facade of things, there's all gross, crawly stuff. So that's my, that's nature. Yeah. Now let's just spend a little bit of time in Pull Salt's Truth Corner. <laughs> no, no jingle here, just truth. And today is the, it's the incredibly sad story of early 20s Paul looking for dating advice on the internet. Quick bit of advice, never fucking do that. <laughs> Don't do that bit. Talk to people you know if you can, or just go about it your own way. Don't ask to internet, because the top results will be things from Bodybuilders Forum, or Ask Men. Yeah. A website which is just as dispiriting as the concept of actually asking men as a gender would actually be in real life. <laughs> um, lots of good advice to be found there. Like, uh, mm-hmm. women like power, so try belittling her <laughs> in front of her friends or colleagues. Or just bench press her desk. I I read one where it encouraged men to sit in front of women with headphones on, just miming taking the headphones off until they actually did, because they're just lonely and needed a chat. (laughs) That sounds awful. And, like, some of this stuff is such abstract shit. Like, women are used to being shorter than men. So if you tilt your head backwards, she'll be, like, more... It'll be more of a subservient position for her, which will turn her on. Oh, wow. I just imagine some lame guy just on the tube, like, do you have a nosebleed? <laughs> no, I just, uh, I think, you know. I think you're pretty hot. What, what, what are you doing later? <laughs> um, but there, anyway, there's one piece of advice in there that really actually freaked me out and stayed with me. Okay. I didn't like it at all. It's, um, women like strong men. They don't want to have to look after you. That's why women aren't attracted to their sons. <coughs> so, first of all, Ew. <laughs> Reframing any parental relationship in the context of sexual interest is just straight up gross and upsetting. Secondly, I think that plays into something really fucking dark. The <laughs> idea that when a woman cares for someone, and specifically men, they develop a resentment for them. They perceive a weakness, which mm. goes against any kind of sexual attraction they might have, which of course men have to try and maintain at all times because any other kind of relationship you might have with a woman is a consolation prize compared to a good mm-hmm. bone down. So you wouldn't um, want to be a friend with a woman, would you? I mean, did you try to have sex with her? <laughs> oh, it didn't work. That's sad. I'm so sorry. Now you have to be a friend. Yeah. Damn. Oh, poor you. Oh, well, here's a bit. You have to have a fulfilling, emotionally enriching relationship with her. Poor you. <laughs> um... But I think there's a lot of nasty shit in there. Mm. Like, man has to be the carer, and women have to be the cared for. And if you try and reverse it, she'll end up hating you. So don't be weak. Mm-hmm. Bottle up those emotions. Um, and what's great about Antichrist is it actually shows the cost of that relationship anyway. The man yeah. tries to be exclusively a caregiver. There's a power hierarchy in mm-hmm. the relationship, and it just fucks everything up. She does seem to resent her child. She abuses him in these subtly awful ways. And mm. at one say she quotes to Defoe, this Robert Her- Herrick poem uh, called Upon Some Women. False in legs, false in thighs, false in breast, teeth, hair, and eyes. She implies that you shouldn't trust the woman who presents herself as weak or shows you sexual affection because there's going to be some kind of motive behind it. Isn't all of this really just a gendered version of feeling like everyone is out to get you? you know, a lot of us get paranoid and think all of our friends and loved ones secretly resent us. And mm. we'll, when we feel that way, we use any tool lying around to help make them feel different from us. Mm. You're a woman. You're a different race. You're an extrovert. You're a cat. You're a Charlie Sheen. Therefore, <laughs> I can't relate to you. I can't understand you. And therefore, I can't fully, I can't fully trust you. And it's fucked because we are all the same. All you know, different, but we're all social animals who find fulfillment in being around each other, mm. and there's no dark heart or ulterior motive needed there. We just like being with each other. Yeah, It's safety in numbers, it's an animal thing, but the fear that there's something dark and fucked up behind it is very real, and I think that's what's affecting 
von Trier here. I'm lucky enough that I don't experience depression. I can just be a bit of a prick sometimes. <laughs> um, and even and I worry enough that people are actually just putting up with me. I can't imagine how von Trier must feel, and he expresses that guilt all the time in saying, my crew had to put up with me. You know, I was useless mm-hmm. on this, and they had to, you know, guide me through it. So the idea that behind their smiles and their support, they're secretly building up this real hatred for him. I, c- I can't imagine how lonely that must feel. So he made a film about it. He made mm-hmm. a film about the thing that scared him most. What if the people he loves and depends upon actually resent the care that they give him? And what if we are all no better than animals pretending at civilization in a world that still works by forest laws? But Antichrist is not a manifesto. It's not an answer to a question. It's not saying, here's the world. It's exactly like this. It's a scream in pain. What do you actually do when your fears are irrational and actually kind of harmful? Because it might lead to you treating people differently that hurts them. What do you do? Lars von Trier made a film. I watched it and I loved it. And I just hope you might watch it too. Very well said. Thank you. I don't know if you've ever thought about, um, similarly to what lurks underneath the stone slab, about Mm. um, what sort of lurks beneath human skin. (gasps) I think about that sometimes. Mm. But... uh, you know how everybody looks you know we're very much with the sum of our parts we we look like bodies we recognize bodies and faces and things like that but underneath it's all a very sort of fragile but but brilliantly working system of veins and organs and nerves and and things like that how how fragile is that really that's what i worry about my science (laughs) teacher once told me that the system that holds your diaphragm to the underside of your lungs is the same thing that keeps a beer mat stuck to the bottom of a beer glass I think we should quickfire. Quickfire. I mean, Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg were amazing. Yes. They were so very, very good in this film. Mm. Um, I love the sort of the uh, title cards that show the title of the film and the director yeah. and also the parts. It's beautiful. Are oh, beautiful, sorry. Yeah. They're sort of weird watercolours, but mm-hmm. with a Lynchian twist. A lot of Lynchian elements in this film, I think. There are. It was kind of a childish... Yeah effect but like dark childhood mm. stuff speaking of the, the child um there's a bit mm. when he turns around from his parents um doing doing sex and he sees the open window and mm. there's a for a moment he looks directly into the camera and it's pretty fucking haunting one of the silent images we see during the opening montage is the baby monitor which is set to silent but you can see the um yeah. bar fill up full so the kid is you know making noise but they can't they've chosen not to be able to hear it and maybe it's yeah. another insidious little indication that charlotte gainsborough has um sabotaged the whole thing and actually planned for the kid to kill himself um yeah by muting the baby monitor it's um really fucked up and very sinister yeah um when it's cutting between charlotte gainsborough and and charlotte gainsborough and william defoe in the hospital Mm. room um charlotte gainsborough is blurred she's just sort of waking up from a sort of it's a mini coma of sorts and william defoe is crisp as he's as he's clinically appraising her <laughs> yeah it's 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 the first of many difficult scenes to watch between them <laughs> um i want to mention the skipped frames so every so often a character yeah. will be sort of sat together and they'll be having a conversation then between one line and the next one of them will have lied down and it'll just cut yeah. to that um the effect is very documentary-esque because we're used to direct mm. co- documentary makers cutting conversations like that um but it's also just utterly disorientating. He's fucking with the grammar of film to really yeah. throw you off. That's amazing. Hammering home the helplessness of the situation as well, as a viewer. Yeah. yeah. You've got no control here. You're at his mercy. Yeah. I mean, the the, the, the visuals, I mean, we could just list them. They're incredible. Yeah. When when Charlotte Gainsbourg is walk, imagining walking through Eden, mm. describing it as you go, the slow motion, the incredible landscapes, everything is so clearly cut. Yeah. And then... When they're when they're together after her um, and her immersion mm. therapy, taking steps across the grass, the two of yeah. them is so intense, and there's still obviously love and care there. It's just not what she she's just, he's just not giving her what she needs, and mm. the, the like the woods just rotting and festering yeah. around the two of them. It's just so powerful. It really <laughs> it's, is. It's it's so lasting. You know that's one of the things that affects me. It's it's it it's will stick with me maybe that's the reason i didn't sleep well last night <laughs> you freaked out One that of the... and not wanting to be called out for for yelling at women who have who have <laughs> rightly said this maybe this film is misogynist <laughs> maybe 
It's just that the, 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 the insert artist picture in the uh, DVD is just Lars von Trier shrugging. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, Me, what? misogynist? rut row. <laughs> One of the really fucking creepy pictures, uh, images that we get shown is very Lynchian because it's kind of like a flashlight or a mm. spotlight shining into a pitch black wood. So there's real darkness there with only the trees in the foreground being brightly lit. Um, and mm. the light kind of moves around and you, c- you you sort of expect things to appear in it. And it's just, and it's apropos of nothing. It's They haven't reached the woods yet when you're seeing this. They're just talking and it cuts to it with this horrifying soundscape. Help me. That's what I'm doing. And it's one of the early sort of really genuine horror moments. The the other thing is just the touching moment after she's had a good night's sleep. Yes. They, when they seem genuinely happy, and there's mm. the the possibility that the two of them might have a conversation that actually leads to something good, <laughs> and you might actually get some emotion from Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but then he ends up still talking to a kind of like a therapist. Yeah, and you can see her heart sink when he does. I think. Yeah. Because he doesn't buy it. He doesn't buy her recovery because it wasn't on his terms. Yeah. You know, and I think more than anything, she just kind of wants to say, I'm cured, now you can treat me like a human being again. And, it, you know, yeah. it's like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Now that she's committed herself to his asylum, it's going to be very hard to prove herself sane. Yeah. The, the, the talking fox has been ridiculed quite a lot, but I think it's an excellent yeah. an excellent part of, of the film. There's just something <laughs> so fucking creepy about chaos reigns. Yeah, fuck, in, in, brilliant. O- opening its mouth like a... Like it's uh, you know it's it's contorted unbelievably. Yeah. It's not. It's it's no longer the fox. It's just this. Well, it's this like harbinger of death. <laughs> it's it's great. Yeah, it's terrifying. I really love it, and um, I don't get why people find it funny. It's terrifying to me, and just also a really cool special effect. And it yeah. it might be my favorite moment of the film. That the um the fox. Oh wow. Okay. It's, um, yeah, it's extraordinary, and, and and to be honest, all of the motifs involving the animals is ex- are extraordinary. The deer with the stillborn hanging from its hind quarters, oh, God, um, yeah. all so yep. beautifully realized, so vividly and believably realized, and yet also unsettling. Again, mm-hmm. it's this idea that it's the horror that's not out to get you physically; it's out to get you psychologically. Like if it can show you enough awful things, it will drive you mad and have its way. Kind of like The Shining. It's just, oh, I love it. I really love it. God. God, yeah. Oh my god, speaking of the sound design, the sound of the acorns. So there's an oh, yeah. acorn tree near the house, and it's the sound of acorns just dropping off the roof, and it really underscores and has a sinister presence. Everything that used to be beautiful about Eden was perhaps hideous. Now I could hear what I couldn't hear before. Thematically, you know, it's the young of the tree, it's the children of the tree falling to their deaths. And it's happening yeah. all the time, just really emphasizing that there could not be a worse place for Willem Dafoe to have taken Charlotte Gainsbourg yeah. to get over the death of her son by falling. It's um, oh. it's, it's a horrifying reminder of that guilt. Yeah, uh, one point I just wrote down, ugh, <laughs> so... <laughs> 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 Who knows what that could have been? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the fact that the writing in Gainsbourg's um, book gets worse. Um, yes. The, the handwriting is like really neat at the beginning, and then as he flips through, it gets worse and worse and worse. And it's quite, it's probably the closest thing to a conventional horror movie trope. You know, it's all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, but it's fabulously unsettling to imagine her just spending hour after hour writing this nonsense and mm. gibberish into this book. It's It's very unsettling. In the same way that it's deeply unsettling to imagine her putting the wrong shoes on her son every oh, day. There's, day in, day out, yeah. Yeah, there's something that really freaks me out about the idea of something being in a photo the whole time and you didn't notice it. I find, Yeah, I find that deeply unsettling. It really is, and Defoe has these pictures of his son that he's probably looked at a whole bunch of times and never noticed before. That for all the smiling and all the pleasantness, the shoes are on the wrong feet in every picture. Yeah. That's so fucking creepy. Yeah. It really um, is the the facelessness of everyone yeah. else in in the movie. The people in the funeral scene will have their faces scratched out. Yeah, and the the blurred and faces of the women who approach him at the end, which is yeah. so, ooh, ooh, creepy. Yeah, you made a good horror film, Lars von Trier. <laughs> you really did. It's fucking frightening. More than anything <laughs> else. 
Now, I've written the feet thing really freaks me out. Oh, it's just, I've already mentioned the shoes, but when he first opens up the, the, the envelope, the autopsy results, and he says in a really creepy voice, The only abnormality in the victim is a slight deformity of the bones in his feet of an earlier date. We do not attach any significance to this. And it's yeah. just, it's the most sinister fucking creepy thing, because you feel like the most important thing in the world is being revealed, because it is. Mm. What's being revealed, very subtly, is the idea that she hated her son, or that she harmed her son due to her depression or something, and it's, it just proves how unstable she is, and he's only coming across it in dribs and drabs, and ugh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my final good <sighs> thing, then. Okay. Came from, I bought the Criterion Collection edition. Ian Christie <laughs> wrote the booklet. And in it, he, he offers this. Antichrist certainly provokes and disturbs. But does this make it a work of genius or merely sensational? Cynically putting censors and audiences to, to the test. Von Trier has always thrived on assaulting good taste and conventional pieties. Here he has mo mobilized the resources of horror cinema to delve into the long history of monstrous femininity and misogyny. Not to reassure us that it's all past or easily curable by therapeutic platitudes, but to make us feel the true horror of facing our buried fears and conflicts. And that is surely the aim of art that matters. Now, sometimes a critic is able to put something just that you were trying to think of and maybe struggled with for a while, and mm. they just put it into perfect words. And that surely is the aim of film criticism that matters. You hear that, Peter Travers? Or Bradshaw with your metaphors. <laughs> Oh. <sighs> All right, I think I'm finally at peace now <laughs> with okay. Antichrist. We can rest. Thank you so much for listening to episode 60 of One Good Thing. Thank you very much. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, probably. Um, OG <laughs> now. Now. <laughs> you, can, you can make it happen. Um, OGT pod is the word you need to find us on all of those things. Just uh, mm -hmm. put an at or a forward slash on it. World's your oyster. But it's going off. Quick, hurry, hurry. <laughs> Eat it. Um, as that lovely gentleman at the beginning said, we're not on Buzzsprout anymore, so please find us on Podbean, download the app, subscribe to our channel, we're the first result when you search for One Good Thing, and leave a review there, and on iTunes and all over the shop. Yeah. My novel Dockhead is available on yeah. Amazon for five ninety nine or cheaper on Kindle. I've updated it now so that it um, has more recipes, uh, more lyrics, um, there's a pull-out 3D map of Ed's basement. Um, also, I've changed the main character's name from Ed to Iron Man. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and it's it's now called Iron Man vs. Identity Crisis, uh, colon, Dockhead. Yep, and I've read it, and it's excellent. It really is very good, everyone. It really is. Um, please do check out my <laughs> reviews on Screen Mayhem. Um, I've just released a choose-your-own-review adventure. So it's all hyperlinks. It's very high-tech. That's screenmayhem.geocities.biz. <laughs> okay, I go back through the, uh, through the door. Okay, turn to page 59. Oh, you hated The Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> Ronda Rousey? <laughs> She kicks the criticism off you. <laughs> yeah. What about our jingles, Paul? Oh, our jingles? Yeah. Well, if you want to find all of our jingles, you can go to... <laughs> That's o <laughs> ogtpod.bandcamp.com. That's what I said. Yeah. You Sorry, I think the you... mic cut out there just oh, okay. for a that second. Was... Oh, that's weird. You probably, yeah. probably get that sorted. Yeah, I get that. But no, no, Absolutely. it's true. Fair... You can get the whole album for... It is £2.50. Nice. Please Fuck support, yeah. please review, rate, everything you can. Everything that everyone's been doing so far has been very, very good and helpful. Um, <laughs> everything that everyone has been doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, literally everyone. Now, if you can just do that a little bit more. We just want that little bit more skin off your bones. Well, right. I'm Paul Goodman. I'm Paul Salt. And remember, the one good thing about Antichrist is when two people can sit down and talk to each other with love and understanding, no matter where they're coming from. No. And then cut the clips off. Granddad always said it was a long way to go for a bit of wanking. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Oh my god, it's a rip. Brilliant. And they have Julianne Moore. Inception! Right. Wow. I stuck so many dicks. <laughs> Can you give me five goddamn minutes before you're fucking <laughs> on me? <laughs> oh, they don't make it like Moliere. <laughs> don't make it like R.W. Paul did. <laughs> he knew how to crank a movie camera. <laughs> Train movie, remember that? <laughs> that was balls. <laughs>